Embattled French President Nicolas Sarkozy heads for a tough runoff with socialist candidate François Hollande. Just what will it take for him to keep his job? Or are the socialists on their way back to the Elysee Palace? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Shakuntala Santhawan. François Hollande has moved a step closer to becoming the first socialist president of France since 1995 by beating incumbent Nicolas Sarkozy in the first round of elections. The strong result by the left seems to reflect a desire for change in France after 17 years of centrist conservative presidents, but also a strong result for Marine Le Pen, leader of the far-right National Front Party. She secured 18% of the vote, exceeding her father's second-place result in the 2002 presidential race. From Paris, Andrew Simmons reports. Socialists were celebrating in the capital before the polls even closed. It's close, and it's only the first round. But these people truly believe Francois Hollande is set to win the runoff on May the 6th. He emerged and appeared to be setting the tone of a president in waiting. Les Français et les Français se sont the people have mobilized in a massive way in this election and a rare level of participation. 80% turnout is a big number. What has been shown is that I am in the lead. I want to thank you all warmly. Hollande may not have had the confident swagger of his opponent, but he captured the confidence of millions of French people. This election comes at a crucial time for France with its faltering economy and for a whole continent struggling with the Eurozone crisis. Sarkozy is seen by many as having failed to live up to his promises. He's fighting for his political life. So much of this election has been about his style rather than the substance of any achievements. Les Français ont pris la mesure. The French today have understood the historic choice they have had to make for this presidential election. They have thrown away all the predictions, and in doing this, they've expressed themselves. It's a crisis vote stemming from their worries, their suffering and anxieties, having to face this new world that's in the process of such change. They may be putting a brave face on it, but it's a grim situation. Right to the last minute, close advisers to Sarkozy had hoped that they could push a few percentage points ahead to regain momentum and win this contest. Quite the reverse has happened. Momentum belongs to Hollande and the socialists. The big surprise, though, has been the level of support for Marine Le Pen, a big move to the far right. She's beaten the shock result of her father, Jean-Marie Le Pen, in 2002, who got to the second round. With joy, courage and dignity, against all odds, the French people took on the elite tonight. This first round is not an end, but the beginning of a great union between all those on the right and on the left who love France. The question now is whether Sarkozy can somehow convince more National Front supporters to switch their vote for him in the second round. Undoubtedly, France has come the closest to a move to socialism since François Mitterrand's two-term presidency between 1981 and 1995. Andrew Simmons, Al Jazeera, Paris. So could the socialists make a comeback in France? Let's find out from our guests in Paris. Thierry Marshall Beck, president of the Socialist Youth, and Elizabeth Moutet, columnist for the Sunday Telegraph, and Thomas Clough, a political analyst and head of the Paris office of the European Council on Foreign Relations. Welcome to you all. Anne Elizabeth, if I could start with you, please. This is the first time that a sitting president has lost the first round and been forced into a second round runoff. Is all lost for Sarkozy or Mr. Bling Bling, as the French call him? Well, it's not looking terribly good for him. I don't think everything is lost, but I should say he's got about a 20% chance of inverting the, uh, uh, the trend. Um, if you add all the votes that were cast yesterday, you will find that actually the right uh, still has a majority, but 
Well, that would mean slapping together Monsieur Sarkozy's votes and Madame Le Pen, and they are different. She has said that she didn't want her to um, ask her voters to vote for anybody, and especially not Nicolas Sarkozy. And that's a bit different from the left, where um, two of the left candidates have already said uh, that they wanted their uh, uh, voters to go and vote for François Hollande. So they're not starting from the same standpoint. Thierry, how optimistic are you that François Hollande has victory in the bag? I think that we are leading, but it's only half time and like in a any soccer game, uh, you only win if you win at the, at the end of the game. So it seems that all the proposition of François Hollande in favor of jobs, in favor of youth, in favor of social security for everyone, in favor of uh, environmental issues are the main reason why he is leading right now in the pool, but we, are, we, we need to, uh, uh, to mobilize every French citizen and to uh, uh, have uh, more citizens from coming from other uh, leftist party to vote in favor of uh, François Hollande two weeks from now. now. Thomas, horse trading must be in full swing now. What do the two candidates have to do to win more votes? Well, uh, they have to uh, uh, pull off a, a difficult balancing act, especially Nicolas Sarkozy, I would say. On the one hand, he has to clearly reach out uh, to the electorate, the 20% of the nearly 20% of the electorate uh, that voted for Marine Le Pen, the far-right candidate of the National Front in the first round, uh, which means that he has to increase uh, uh, the right-wing spin or lurch of his campaign messaging. But at the same time, if he does that too much, he loses the votes uh, of the centrist candidate, François Bayrou. So he's caught in a very difficult game of triangulation, which some analysts say is actually a mission impossible. Uh, François Hollande comes out of this first round with uh, uh, quite a good headwind. Uh, what he has to do is maintain uh, the momentum, uh, energize, of course, uh, his own party base, and, uh, uh, and he will have to withstand very serious attacks from uh, a sitting president who's going to be an extremely aggressive campaigner uh, over the next two weeks. Okay, let's take a, a closer look at the choices facing voters in the presidential election runoff. In a bid to court right-wing voters, Nicolas Sarkozy has campaigned hard on immigration. He wants to halve the number of foreigners entering the country illegally and increase deportation of illegal immigrants. He's also promised to raise up to around 3 billion euros or 4 billion dollars by tightening profit tax loopholes for big companies. And in a move that would lower the cost of labor for employers, he plans to raise VAT to fund a reduction in social charges. Meanwhile, socialist candidate François Hollande has been very vocal in opposing a financial policy based on austerity. He's promised to renegotiate the EU fiscal compact to stimulate growth and create new jobs. His plan includes $26 billion or 20 billion euros of new spending over five years that will help create 150,000 new jobs to tackle youth unemployment, plus new positions in education and the police. Hollande also wants to reverse tax breaks for the wealthy with a 75% tax rate on those earning more than $1.3 million or 1 million euros. In theory, if we could come back to you, can Olan really deliver on all his promises? Of course he can, and that's why uh, I'm supporting him. I think that we are facing very difficult time. Uh, in a Sarkozy presidency, uh, we've got one million more people unemployed, so we are facing a very difficult situation, and we need to create more jobs, and we are not going to create more jobs if we are staying in the same uh, 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 construction of the European Union. We need to change the track of the EU. We need to put the EU on social tracks, on, uh, on the, the, the big issue is how can we create more jobs in the European Union. And in, fa in order to do so, we need to change the monetary policy. We need to have uh, a new treaty in favor of jobs, in favor of growth. And that's why we need to put an end to the uh, austerity uh, that uh, Nicolas Sarkozy and Ang Angela Mer Merkel agreed on against uh, the, their own citizen, because when the, the citizen have got the opportunity to vote, 
they don't vote for them. It was a, a defeat for Nicolas Sarkozy uh, yesterday night, but it was a defeat as well for Angela Merkel. So we need a new uh, European construction in favor of jobs, in favor of environmental issues, in favor of people who are working all across Europe and are facing a very difficult economic situation. Anna Elizabeth, what do you think? Are the promises made by the two men realistic? Uh, no, I don't think they are. Um, I, it, we've come to an extent at the, uh, in the world economic crisis in which basically uh, the debt of most Western European nations uh, have almost um, uh, reached uh, the size of their, uh, um, uh, their uh, GDP and therefore that is almost impossible to service if you do not have some cuts. If nobody wants cuts because cuts are you know, difficult to, to live with, but you cannot live on credit all the time. Uh, take one reform that Nicolas Sarkozy made, which was the pension reform. Uh, the, in 1945, you had eight uh, people working who paid for the pension, pay-as-you-go pension, for what, two, one retiree. Today, it's only two. Uh, people live 18 years more in, in, on average. Um, fewer people work. You can't pay for this kind of social welfare if you keep spending, and therefore you need cuts, and you need to organize the, this in an orderly way. And what Sarkozy tried to do was to organize this in an orderly way. This pension reform, which Monsieur Hollande wants to revert, only raised the pension age by two years. It was relatively painless and even that uh, we're being told that it is unacceptable and that everybody should have everything they want all at once uh, but that works only if you do not believe that there's an economic crisis in the world but I don't think it's achievable I think it's uh, far more spending and in two years time it's going to be like under Francois Mitterrand when Francois Mitterrand was elected socialist president of France in 1981 for two years everybody said we can do everything we want and then they came back they asked for money from various international organizations and they went back to a normal system because it would be great if it were possible to create jobs and spend your way out of a crisis, but unfortunately it's impossible. Now over to you, Thomas. Uh, stimulus measures can certainly be promised in the campaign to try and win votes, but whoever wins the presidency will have to make deep spending cuts, won't they, like everywhere else in the Eurozone? Well, that's precisely uh, uh, going to be uh, the quandary in terms of uh, the direction for economic and budgetary and fiscal policy which uh, uh, the new president, whoever he is, uh, will find himself faced with. And that's a quandary which he very, he, there's no she in the game, uh, he will very much share uh, with other uh, government leaders across the Eurozone. Uh, we've seen governments politically as, as different uh, as the new centre-right Spanish government, very committed ideologically uh, to bring down the debt and deficit. Uh, being faced with uh, the clash between the Spanish economy underperforming uh, even more than uh, the last year's forecasts led one to expect uh, and being caught between a rock and a hard place uh, because they found themselves unable to uh, satisfy the Eurozone partners' initial demand for very tough austerity calls, calls because the Spanish economy is doing even worse than people thought. A very similar situation now has emerged in Italy uh, with Mario Monti, another credible uh, costs and deficit cutter, uh, uh, pushed to stagger in time his uh, debt and deficit reduction plans because uh, the Italian economy is so deeply affected. François Hollande is going to be, uh, if he's elected, uh, and Nicolas Sarkozy, of course, too, uh, be faced with the same situation. Uh, and it's a very difficult balancing act. Uh, uh, which governments across the Eurozone have to do. On the one hand, clearly debts and deficit must be brought down. But if austerity is applied too massively, there is a danger that the economy across the Eurozone is pushed into uh, a recession, uh, which will then decrease intakes and increase outtakes. And that would be bad news even for debt and deficit reduction. Thierry, I can see you shaking your head. Uh, do you think Alain can find the right balance between austerity and spending? I think that we need to agree on one thing. If you cut spending, you are killing the growth. And if you're killing the growth, you increase the debt. We, uh, Nicolas Sarkozy, Sarkozy and Angela Merkel asked the people in Greece to cut spending. The only consequences of this, uh, uh, of this politics, uh, it's they, they decrease spending, but the debt 
was higher because they did, un did not have tax more taxes because they are killing the, gr the growth in Greece. So we need to have growth in the e European Union. We need to have growth. In, in order to, to have that, we need a new monetary policy. In the United States of America, President Obama, he was in favor of increasing at the beginning spending in order to have more growth, in order to have more jobs, and in order to have more taxes. Uh, in, uh, and in order to pay uh, the, the, the budget. So I think that all the policies that lead to have one more million people unemployed in France, uh, all the talk by right-wing uh, activists saying we need to cut spending, we need to cut spending, because the only thing they love is cutting spending and, uh, and uh, uh, in order to erase all the social, uh, all the things that it's not the market, all the things in favor of people who are working. I think that the, the, the main goal of, uh, uh, of the left in our country and in all the European Union is to do a, a policy in favor of workers, in favor of workers and people who need uh, to have a job and who need to work in order to uh, uh, pay a good education for their family, in order to pay a good wealth, uh, a good, uh, good health care for their family, in order to pay, them, uh, to pay vacation for their family. So if you are cutting spending, you are killing the growth in Europe and you are destroying jobs. I think that we need to have that uh, in mind when we are talking about the future of the uh, European Union and that's why François Hollande, like all leftist leaders all across Europe, are in favor of a politics in favor of growth and of more jobs and fighting unemployment because it is the key issues for workers in our continent. Anne Elizabeth, how do you see France's uh, relationship with the EU changing should François Hollande uh, take the reins of power? Well, actually, I uh, think François Hollande is surrounded by uh, people who are very pro-EU. So I suspect the rhetoric that our friend has just now expressed is probably not going to be followed in fact. Um, uh, it's very likely that the Prime Minister will be Martine Aubry, who, is the leader of the, who was the leader of the Socialist Party for several years and who succeeded François Hollande and who's the daughter of Jacques Delors, the artisan of the Maastricht Treaty. Uh, it's very likely that the Finance Minister will be Pierre Moscovici, who was a European Affairs Minister. Um, François Hollande, at the end of the day, has been pushing this left-wing rhetoric that we're hearing just now. But uh, the people around him are the same technocrats who've been ruling France for quite some time. So in some ways, I'm less worried about this because I suspect even François Hollande's voters will be the first ones surprised uh, that uh, he doesn't actually apply the policies of Jean-Luc Mélenchon, but he applies the policies that have been those of everybody left of centre or right of centre in France. I suspect uh, there will be experiments and then France will sort of get into the guidelines. Uh, in the EU, Mrs Merkel and uh, the European Council will uh, give uh, uh, the French socialist a kind of sop, but at the end of the day, the policies won't change. Thomas, what do you think? Uh, will collaboration with the EU change under Hollande? Uh, well, if your question is about cooperation in Europe, I think what we'll see, and in the Eurozone more specifically, uh, what we'll see uh, is a phase of difficult negotiations, uh, tough talk uh, uh, between Paris and Berlin especially, other Eurozone partners too, but Paris and Berlin will remain the main actors, and indeed François Hollande has said that Angela Merkel, even if she's from the opposite side of the political spectrum, will remain his main partner in Europe. His first trip will be to Berlin. Um, but I also see that after, after a few difficult meetings uh, and a period lasting certainly weeks, possibly months, uh, we will see uh, a compromise being thrashed out at Eurozone level. Uh, François Hollande w won't be alone with a call to do more about growth and for growth in the Eurozone. The European Commission uh, is working on, on, on initiatives. Uh, he might get backing from the IMF if he plays his cards well. He might get backing from publications such as the Financial Times or, uh, or The Economist. Um, and the German government is aware that they cannot afford to let their new, if it is François Hollande who's elected, their new main partner in Europe, uh, the, the French president of whatever political hue he is, uh, go back home empty-handed. They can't brush him off with just cosmetic changes. And if you look at the personal level of interaction between the, uh, the two leaders, if it is François Hollande on the French side, then you can actually imagine that the chemistry 
uh, after the few months of getting to know each other and thrashing out the policy differences between uh, François Hollande and, and Angela Merkel, uh, possibly working quite well. These are two people who, from if you look at their psychological profile, as it were, are not that dissimilar. Uh, share a similar sense of humour. They uh, uh, they like to take the time over decisions. They're both consensus builders. Um, and so you could imagine uh, the chemistry working quite well. And one last thing, François Hollande, when he was asked to mention four leaders he seeks, he, he looks at for inspiration, looking at their record, mentioned Obama, Lula, Mandela, all that was quite predictable. But then he mentioned Helmut Kohl, uh, Germany's reunification chancellor, uh, the grand old man uh, of the German Christian Democrats. And for a French socialist president, can presidential candidate to do that uh, was, I think, quite significant and remarkable and interesting. Okay, so we've heard what you think about how the relationship uh, between France and the EU might change under Hollande. What about uh, France's relationship with the rest of the world? Uh, I think that uh, we are going to have a new uh, diplomatic uh, policy when uh, François Hollande is going uh, to be uh, uh, the president uh, of France. It's what's, it's, that is what the, the French citizens uh, want. We are not going to be uh, anymore uh, inviting dictators in, uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, the Elysee Palace uh, like uh, Gaddafi. We are not going uh, to uh, support dictators in uh, Tunisia like uh, uh, the former uh, minister uh, um, uh, Michel Aliomari uh, did. I think that we are going uh, to take back the, uh, the, the, the good old uh, p policy of uh, French uh, diplomacy in favor of, uh, uh, human, of uh, human rights, in favor of uh, multilateralism, and in favor of a strong uh, European Union on, uh, on foreign relation. And, and I think that we are going uh, uh, to put France back in the track of, uh, uh, of a leader in, uh, on human rights at the uh, international level. But at the same time, uh, we need to protect our industry and the EU need to protect uh, the European Union industry. So we are going to have uh, some talk uh, with uh, uh, China, with uh, India, with Brazil and other countries all across the world in order to implement right now fair trade. Because if we, we, we live in a globalized world and it's a good thing we live in a globalized world, but we need fair trade because workers uh, in the European Union are facing a very difficult time and we need to, them to have better wages, we, are, we need them to, have, uh, to, to be better paid, and in order to do that, we need to implement right now fair trade, and that's what François Hollande is going to do if he is elected. And Elizabeth, do you see that happening? What would a socialist win mean for France's foreign policy? Um, I think there will be changes. I think the idea that we're not going to receive dictators anymore in France and frankly, you know, not going to happen because there are dictators in the world. Uh, if we just talk about China, these are people who've got political prisoners, even though they also have, uh, they produce lots of iPhones. Um, and um, it's very nice to be young and enthusiastic, but I remember socialist uh, governments in France from before, and they were not shy of knowing lots of dictators in places like Africa and elsewhere. So I don't think there's going to be much difference is going to be a, a, a different stripe of dictators. Uh, that's all. Um, in terms of uh, globalization, I think, uh, you know, it's actually a, a, a left-winger, Daniel Scone Bendit, the Green leader, the French-German Green leader, who said that if you're against immigration and then you're against globalization, that means that you do not want to let the rest of the world work either in your country or in their own countries. So you've got to let them work and, and, and sort of raise their own standards of living. And if that doesn't make your industry competitive, then your industry has got to change so that uh, you produce things that nobody else can produce, that the gray matter um, is still yours, and uh, that changes the balance of the world. The idea that you're going to sort of uh, help uh, the unions the old way by saying, oh, we, more, we want more benefits, we want more social welfare net, we want help, um, and, and not do anything different from what you did before, that doesn't exist. Um, if, you, if you are Apple, for instance, it's your, at the end of the day, the entire conception is still American because that's where the gray matter is, that's where the added value is, and it doesn't matter that it's reduced in China. Um, I think France has already started, actually, France has got some very competitive corporations that have already started globalizing. And, um, uh, but the idea that we're going to sort of go back and help the um, workers of Europe in the middle of an economic crisis, um, get uh, huge pay rises and, and more benefits, that is cloud cuckoo land.
I wish we could uh, continue some more, but uh, we have to leave it there for now. Thank you all very much for your time. Thierry Marshall Beck, Anne Elizabeth Moutet, and Thomas Clow, all in Paris. And thank you very much for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. If you have any feedback that you want to share, please just email us your thoughts, insidestory at aljazeera.net. From me and the team here in Doha, goodbye for now.